Okay, Rainer. Yeah, I think we're good to go. Thank you for uh, for for joining us remotely, and um, looking forward to your session. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be again part of Techorama. I am just joining here remotely, but I hope it will be a very good experience for all of us, you in the room in the Netherlands and for me here in Austria near Linz. The topic today that I'm going to cover in the next 50 minutes or so, so we have a little bit of time for Q&A at the end, is um, WASM, WebAssembly, and the title that I chose was WASM the Container Killer? Question mark. That means that we are not going to talk about WebAssembly in the browser. That is not our topic today, but we are going to talk about what WebAssembly means out of the browser and what that has to do with technologies like container technologies, for instance. One word of warning at the beginning to set the expectations straight if you think that you look at this session and you leave this session and you are going to use the technologies that I'm going to present tomorrow in production, I'm very sorry, I have to disappoint you. I will show a lot of preview stuff. Preview stuff that breaks, that is not finished, that is not there yet. This session is more of a strategic session. Where is WebAssembly heading towards? What does WebAssembly promise for the future? These are the questions that I'm going to discuss here. So it's a kind of long-term vision where WebAssembly is currently heading to. Okay, this is, this is not production stuff that you can use tomorrow in your company, for instance, for a, a business critical system. I would definitely not recommend that. Okay, before I get started, let me quickly introduce myself. I am Rainer Stropik. Um, here I can move my video on top of the picture because you see me live. Um, I'm a passionate developer for more than 25 years. I have been at various Techoramas over the last years. And yeah, I, I enjoy coding. Every day when I can write code is a good day. This is what I always say. Um, I'm currently, mm, I have been for more than 10 years a Microsoft MVP and regional director. That does not mean that I'm on the payroll of Microsoft. Uh, absolutely not. I have my own little uh, consulting company. We do work in the cloud, uh, cloud computing software as a service. This is primarily what we do, but I do a lot of work in the community. So I'm very happy to have these two titles. Um, Beside me writing code for our own company, I'm a passionate trainer, teacher and mentor uh, doing workshops all over Europe on, on different technologies and I love the community. I'm chairman of the Coding Club Linz. Um, I co-founded and again chairman uh, of the Coded Dojo Linz, which is a programming club for kids. And finally, I co-founded the Rust Linz meetup, which we have been doing for over two years now. So this is essentially me. You can ask me whatever you want around software development and in some areas I hope I can give answers. With that, without any further ado, let's jump right into it. Let me move my image a little bit down because now I am not so interesting anymore. The screen is way more interesting. Please join me on a, on a short journey towards answering the question, why? Why are we using container technologies today? And one of the most important questions that we have at th that containers answer is the question of trust. Do we trust in the code that we run? We all know that today, software security is a very important topic. So we must only run code that we really trust. We take code from trusted sources, like trusted suppliers, trusted employees. We have open source software. Between large companies, there are trusted supply chain systems, where one company hands over in a trusted way source code to another company, which maybe builds that into some packages and then uh, makes the software available through some kind of package management or container system or something like this. So trust is a very important thing. There are also trusted languages uh, like Rust, for instance, you're going to see a lot of Rust code today versus C, which is not that trusted. But the question is, how far can that go? Who can we really trust? What about supply chain attacks? What about people going rogue? What about human errors? It doesn't need to be um, a, a bad intention. It can also be just a mistake. 
So what we need is we need to somehow isolate the code that we run and that we write. So trust is okay and it's important for today's system, but also we need limits. We need some kind of, as you see it here in this picture, sandboxes. We need to, we need to embed our code uh, and give it boundaries where it needs to stay inside. That's the whole idea. And here, over the years, we as IT professionals have developed multiple strategies. If we need to run isolated, untrusted or semi-trusted code, we want that this code has only a limited view on the system on which it runs. Because it might have some neighbors. This untrusted or semi-trusted code might have code, uh, might have business critical code running on the same machine, which it must not interfere with. So therefore, uh, we need to isolate it and it doesn't allow it to see all the processes on the host system. We want it to have an isolated file system, for instance. We want to exactly control the network. Where is this code allowed to, uh, to communicate with and things like that. This is a very important thing if we want to run untrusted or semi-trusted code inside of our data centers on our, on our precious servers. We also want to be protected from code going rogue using an, 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 a really large amount of memory, for instance, or a really large amount of CPU power that would again negatively influence other software components which run on the same machine. So we need to have limited access to resources for the untrusted or semi-trusted code. And over the years, we have developed multiple strategies for how to tackle this problem. In the ancient early days, we separated components which must be isolated using physical machines. We took them, we bought multiple servers and we installed certain pieces of software on a certain a physical server and if this was very precious, we ran nothing else on top of this server. This was very expensive, very time consuming, um, not very, uh, not very uh, sustainable. So th this was the early days of IT. Then came virtual machines. Virtual machines make things a lot easier. We don't have physical servers, but we have virtual servers and the virtualizers, they, they kind of simulate the existence of a virtual hardware. They have a virtual CPU, virtual memory and things like that. And it made things much, much easier. But still, using virtual machines is a lot of work. Um, also, if we run many, many virtual machines, we have many, many instances of the operating systems running on these machines, so it's a kind of waste of resources. Therefore, we introduced containers, which is similar to virtual machines. I'm pretty sure that everybody in the room has at least a rough understanding of what containers are. They are virtualization on the operating system level. So we have the operating system kernel only once and then on top of these operating system kernels, we have our maybe Linux distros or we run some distro-less containers or whatever we do. It already became a lot easier. It's, it's easier to isolate our code. It's easier to deal with containers. So this is the next level of, um, of isolation that we introduced. And of course, we can always fall back to processes. If it's enough to isolate some code in a process on the operating system level, we can definitely do that. That makes life of developers a little bit easier because inter-process communication is easier than communication between containers. If I want to talk from one container to the other, I need some kind of distributed system. I need some gRPC stuff. Processes is a little bit easier. It's again a little bit more lightweight, but it is less isolated. So at the end of the day, even today, as we have containers and processes and virtual machines and physical machines, as DevSecOps ops people, we have to think about what is the right level of isolation? How critical is our software component? So this is my thought on the topic of isolation. At the end of the day, it should prevent our code to leave a kind of sandbox, as you can see it here. We want to prevent our code to negatively influence anybody else because of security thoughts. Good, but security is not everything. I'm a developer and I really also care about efficiency, about performance and things like that. I could put every component on a separate physical server, but that wouldn't be efficient. I can put every function 
into a separate container and forget about function calls and do cross-container communication using gRPC or something like instead. It is not efficient. So let's talk a little bit about efficiency and how efficiency influence our thoughts in that area. Efficiency, efficiency as I see it, uh, has, has two different aspects to it. First, hardware. We want to make good use of hardware resources. Hardware is expensive, hardware is expensive to buy, is expensive to run. Um, we want to have sustainable data centers, so we want to re reduce the number of iron that we have in our data centers. So this is a very important thing. But efficiency is also important when it comes to people's time. Let's be frank, the people in this room are a scarce resource. There are not many people who are capable of writing software. And therefore, we have to make sure that we, as developers, use our time efficiently. So efficiency is hardware and people's time, of course. So sharing on the different levels that you see here influence the use, the efficiency of the use of hardware and people time, people's time. If we use VMs on hypervisors, we are not really making good use of resources in terms of hardware because we need a lot of hardware, way more than if we just use containers. But if we use containers, are we really making good use of people's time? There is this famous saying that microservices is turning a function call into an adventure. And I'm a strong believer in that saying. What does that mean? It means that if we put everything in a container, we have a nicely separated, isolated component world. Nobody can negatively influence anybody else. But as a developer, it takes an endless amount of time to write the code. And the code is not efficient because doing a kind of network protocol to communicate with a container, with another container, takes a lot of runtime compared to different processes or even the same process. So as a developer, if I want to make the best use of resources, I want to put everything in a monolithic same process environment where I can simply do a function call. Ideally, not even a virtual function call. That is fast. That is fast. That is easy to develop. That is easy to debug. So we have two conflicting goals here. Security and isolation go up and do as much isolation as possible. Ideally, put a separate server on everything. In terms of efficiency, hardware, runtime, and people's time, we go down and say, put everything in a single process and we are good because then we are fast, we are efficient as developer, we feel good. So there are a lot of influencing factors and nowadays it's kind of hard to decide what is the correct level of isolation because we have these two conflicting goals that I just mentioned. In terms of efficiency, containers can help to a certain degree. They are definitely more efficient than virtual machines, no question about that. But still, if you have a lot of containers and you put a lot of microservices into, let's say, a Kubernetes cluster or something like this, this is more complex than putting everything in a single process and doing just function calls. So we have DevOps toil, we have reduced developer productivity. So containers can help to a certain degree. In practice, we always have to find some, some compromises. We have to choose between simplicity and productivity and security, and we have to find a, a suitable compromise for the concrete project. That is the term of efficiency. Let's go into the next big topic, and then we will jump into demos, and I will show you how WebAssembly can make things easier here. Cross-platform. The third thing, besides security by isolating code and efficiency, is cross-platform. Nowadays, we really want to build software once and run it everywhere, independent of whether it's the public cloud, whether it's Linux or Windows or an on-prem Kubernetes cluster or whatever we want to do. We want to build code and we want to run it everywhere, even inside the browser. If I build some component, some business logic component, I want to run it everywhere. Server, client, Windows, Linux, public cloud, private cloud, wherever I want. So what came up are languages which are by design portable. Let's think of a language like C-sharp. Tecorama has a, a strong footprint in the .NET space, so let's talk a little bit about it. We can compile C-sharp to intermediate language, and then we can take this intermediate language and run it essentially everywhere. 
We have a JIT compiler, a just-in-time compiler, and we run it on a server, on a desktop computer, and we can even use WebAssembly in the browser, as you all know from the Blazor framework, to run C-sharp intermediate language in the browser. Awesome! Double thumbs up, this is what we want. Or take JavaScript, for instance. It runs also nearly everywhere. However, just-in-time compilers and portable code have a disadvantage. The just-in-time compiler is, relatively speaking, slow. Yeah? JavaScript, compiling it and executing it, takes a while. C-sharp code, IL, to machine language, takes a while. So what the world is heading to is a kind of AOT, and the holy grail would be to use the benefits of ahead-of-time compilation, but still having portable software. This is exactly what I just said. Containers cannot really help in that realm. Because containers, they are just a kind of isolation mechanism. So if I can run on a container, that does not mean that I can run on Linux and Windows, on the contrary. I have to decide where I would like to run. If I use AOT, I have to decide whether it's Windows or Linux and x68 or x64 and things like that. In, in, in .NET, there are some tools that can help like ready-to-run format. If you haven't uh, dealt with it, if you, have, if you don't know what I mean, take a look at it. It's really cool. It's a kind of compromise again. But still, if you want to do native IoT, compiling down to machine language, I have to decide. So, build once, run everywhere is true on the source code level, but not on the compilation target. The compilation target is specific. This is what we have. This is the situation that we have in terms of cross-platform. And now comes the important part. Portability plus efficiency plus a sandbox. So isolation means WebAssembly. And this is why I suggested this talk. Let's talk a little bit about why I say that. Let's stay a little bit in the area of WebAssembly be before we go into the demos, okay? So, ah, where should I put my, my video? I think, I think here is okay. Here is okay. So let's talk a little bit about what this WebAssembly is. Everybody, I assume, has a little bit of knowledge what this WebAssembly is all about, but let's, let's really summarize it so that we are all on the same page here. WebAssembly is not web and not full assembly. It's, it's kind of both, and that's the whole idea. Everything started, of course, in the browser. Somebody had a little bit of C code and wanted to run it in the browser. So what can we do? First step was compile the C code to JavaScript, call it ASMGS and run it in the browser. Next step, why do we need JavaScript in the middle? Let's invent, and now comes the important part, a binary instruction format. It's like JavaScript, but binary and very low level. So WebAssembly, at the end of the day, it's a virtual machine, it's a binary instruction format for a virtual machine which is stack-based, very, very low level, similar to real-world assembler, way more low level than C-sharp intermediate language, for instance. So we are talking about um, a binary instruction format which is very near to what today's CPUs can execute or do, do execute. This is what WebAssembly essentially is. And with that, it is completely language agnostic. I can take any language that is capable of, of rendering code out in this binary instruction format and use it as a compilation target. So take your C code, compile it to WASM. Take your Rust code, compile it to WASM. Take your C sharp code, compile it to WASM. It's a compilation target. Typically, nobody writes WebAssembly directly. It's possible using WebAssembly text format, so it is possible. There is something like a NASM or, or MASM or something like this where you can write WebAssembly directly, but in practice, this is only for experiments. In real world, you take a higher language, language like C or C Sharp or Rust and compile it to WebAssembly. And the important thing is that this WebAssembly nowadays can run inside the browser. All major browsers support WebAssembly, but this is not our topic today, but it can also run out of the browser. So what you essentially need then is some kind of host. So um, you cannot run wasn't directly on Windows or directly on Linux. What we need is we need a software component that takes this WebAssembly binary instruction format and does the compilation, the last very small step towards the concrete CPU instruction that, that set that it is running on. And this is exactly the job of the host. There are ready-made hosts, like for instance, wasn't time. You will see it today. It's an 
awesome component is ha it has reached version 1.0 so this thing is really production ready but you can also easily create custom hosts and I will show you that you will see a custom host written in C sharp and you will see a custom host written no, I don't have a custom host written in Rust because um, that is easy. It can easily be looked up, for instance, on the Wasn't Time website. That's really not complicated. But we we have to add a few more acronyms here because WebAssembly alone is, as I said, very low level. For instance, its time system is time, its type system is extremely limited. You can only return some numeric data types. Uh, some numeric data types that all, that's all WebAssembly knows. So it, you can you can move around some numbers between the host and the guest. But what about higher level types? What about structures? What about strings and so on? What about uh, file access? What about network access? We need more there. So WebAssembly is just the underpinning. And on top of WebAssembly, we have a collection of very interesting standards, like, for instance, WASI, the WebAssembly Systems Interface. And now we are coming towards why WebAssembly is a little bit like containers, because this WebAssembly Systems Interface is a cross-platform OS agnostic feature set um, that allows WebAssembly code to interact with the host, for instance, in order to read files, in order to make an HTTP request or something like this. And this WebAssembly system interface, this WASI, can be configured. It can be limited. See? Like containers, right? We can simply run our components inside WebAssembly, wrap WASI around it, and suddenly we have isolation without a container. And that's pretty awesome. But still, we don't have a type system. How can we make sure that we can run our code and, and mix code from C Sharp and, and Rust and so on? Um, here we have the, the uh, what project, the WebAssembly types project, which is currently undergoing a lot of, of, of changes and so on. But still, the idea is that you describe your WebAssembly component in a, in a language agnostic way and then you have a lot of conversion tools which can take this description of the interface and convert it to Rust code or convert it to C code and so on and that makes it very easy to communicate between languages between a host and a guest in terms of WebAssembly modules. So this is the second thing that is very similar to containers isolation in container technology is not just used for for setting boundaries between trusted and untrusted code it's also sometimes used to isolate different implementation technologies do you have one team that loves to write rust and the other team that loves to write go and then suddenly these two things have to talk together you are forced to put them in separate containers because there are different runtimes there are different libraries yeah, different compilers we can use containers for that, but suddenly with WebAssembly, we don't need containers for that anymore. We simply compile the Go code to a WASM module, we compile the Rust code to a WASM module, and then we build a host or take a ready-made host like WASM time, and this host simply doesn't care whether the component is written in Go or in Rust. It's WebAssembly. The, the type system is WebAssembly types. The interfaces are WebAssembly systems interface, WASI. So we have a standard to communicate in process with sandbox, WebAssembly code runs inside a sandbox, without has us having to deal with the problems of containers. That's probably the last extensibility or component system that you ever have to learn about because it defines this platform, OS and, and programming language independent standards where everybody can plug in. Every team can choose which language they want to use and you don't need to separate them into containers. You still can do a simple function call. The saying, microservices is like, uh, like uh, doing, uh, <laughs> microservices is turning function calls into an adventure is no longer true because we can suddenly do a function call between C Sharp and Rust without having any kind of gRPC or whatever between it. It simply works because of the magic of WebAssembly. So this is um, what this WebAssembly is all about. And now I spent approximately half an hour introducing you to this world of thought. 
Let's quickly summarize before we go into, into the demo. Isolation, check, because WebAssembly runs in a sandbox where it cannot break out. Cross-platform, check, because we do not compile to native machine code that is specific for a CPU architecture or specific for Windows or Linux or something, we compile to WebAssembly. So cross-platform, as I said, check. Developer productivity, efficiency, efficient use of hardware resources, of, of developers' resources, also check because we do not need virtual machines we do not need containers we do not need to cross container boundaries using using some web apis or grpc or whatever we simply can make a function call ah uh, yes that's true to a very high degree but unfortunately i make it sound a little bit nicer than it currently is webassembly is a moving target the whole WebAssembly systems interface, WebAssembly types, WebAssembly components is currently being developed. So the, the, the thing with efficiency is not yet true because the tools aren't where they probably will be in a few years. So if you play now with this technology, you have to deal with a lot of edges a lot of rough edges because the toolings, the standards, the versions, they haven't all reached production quality yet. This is why I said what I'm going to show you now in the demos and what I told you is a kind of strategic outlook. Don't leave this room and tell your peers that you should throw out containers tomorrow and replace everything with WebAssembly. Mm, that will be embarrassing because it will simply not work. It's more a strategic outlook where we are going to, okay? Good, and with that, let's dive right into the first few demos. I will not write the code because I have too many demos uh, to show you. I will just walk you through the code. The entire code is available on GitHub and it is linked on my slides. So let's go here. This is my first demo. I have it on my second monitor and I will put it here and put my video down here so it should work nicely. The first very, very simple example wants to show you how we can, uh, in a very granted, very, very simple program, how we can run the most complicated Rust library that you can think of. This one, see it? Yeah? So here you see you have a function in Rust which will simply return an integer 32. I wanted to keep the sample really consciously simple so I don't deal with WebAssembly types and strings and structures. Very, very simple. A data type that WebAssembly supports natively, an integer 32. And I will simply take two variables here, x and y, and add them and return it. That's all. So please don't be angry with me. Use your imagination. There will be a lot more going on here as we as we reach our next demos. But still, this is an this is Rust code. Okay? Th this is Rust code. So let's take a look at the second project here. And this project is C sharp. So what I essentially want to do, I want to make this C sharp application a WebAssembly host. So I don't want to use a ready-made host like wasn't time. I want, imagine that you're writing a business app in C-sharp and you would like to have an extensibility point. Your customers can provide you with extensions and you would like to safely run these extensions inside of your, I don't know, ASP.NET Core application. Of course, you can't run it in the same process. That would be way too risky. You have to, on the one hand side, make sure that it runs in a sandbox. You have to tightly control how much power, how much CPU, how much memory it can use. And this is exactly what I want to show you. This program uses a NuGet package from WasmTime, from the WasmTime project. I told you WasmTime is this WebAssembly runner and it does not only provide you with a command line interface that you can use on a server, but it also provides you with various libraries that can be used from different languages. Go, Rust, C Sharp and other languages. Please check the documentation of WasmTime to learn more about it. Now I used this NuGet package to write these few lines of code. I will not walk you through all the lines because we have so many demos to look at, but I think many things can be, can be guessed from the context. Let me point out a few things here. Here you see how we load the WebAssembly file. This is the worker file that we get from our Rust code down here. 
Now the next is we set up a linker and a store. I will not go into details what this is. These are concepts from WebAssembly and WebAssembly from Wasm Time. So I will not go into the details here, but I would like you to take a closer look here. We are adding fuel. Whatever this fuel means, it sounds a little bit like, like blockchain, but don't worry, this is not blockchain, okay? And um, last but not least, we are instantiating this thing and getting a function which returns an integer value, you see it here, and we have called it get answer. And then we simply run this delegate and we print the result and we, st and we print on the screen the so-called consumed fuel, okay? The exception already gives you a hint what comes next, but first we run it as it is, okay? So what I did, I created a so-called just file. There is a nice little tool <clears throat> which is called just. It's like make, the make tool, but a little bit more modern, written in Rust, so I really like to use the just file. And I have created two, um, two rules here, two just rules. The first one is called build. It compiles the Rust code using Cargo, and then it copies the WebAssembly file into our C Sharp project, and then it simply runs .NET build, as you can see it here. And the second one, the run thing, runs the build, and then it calls .NET run. So it runs the application. So let's say just run, okay? And what we see is, hopefully, hopefully, .NET run is running. Oh yeah, see? The result is 42, it consumed 30 fuel. So the call was successful, the answer is correct. And to show you what I mean with kind of, of limitation, kind of limitations like a container, I can now reduce the fuel to 10. Fuel is an abstract concept. Typically, every WebAssembly instruction consumes one fuel, but you can also influence that. So if your guest calls into the host and the host wants to uh, wants to withdraw a larger amount of fuel because a certain operation was executed, maybe accessing a database, it can do so. So fuel is an abstract concept, abstracting away the number of CPU cycles. So now we are limiting fuel to 10 and you see before we used 30 fuel. So let's run this thing again and it will throw an exception, obviously, because this is the whole thing of the of the demo here. We ran out of fuel. So what WebAssembly, the WebAssembly sandbox did, it stopped the execution of our Rust plugin, although Rust is a native language, it stopped it and said, nope, this now you are out of fuel, I will no longer execute you. This is the exception that you see here. So what you see here is a C-sharp host with a Rust component with limited fuel where we can make sure that the embedded semi or untrusted plugin will not go rogue. And in similar ways, you could do some memory limitations and so on. So this was my first demo. This was the first one. This was a custom host. Let's go to the next demo. I will quickly switch to the next demo. This is this demo here. Um, and the first one is this demo here. Now we are in the Rust land, no la longer in um, uh, no longer in, in C-sharp, but we are in the Rust world. And again, I have created a bunch of, of just rules. You can take a look at the code later on. I will walk you through uh, for the remaining, I don't know, 15 minutes or so. Um, the first one is a very simple Rust application. It's probably the most simple Rust application that you can come up with. It's the Hello World application. By the way, this is just a macro, as you can see it here. Rust is heavily based on macros, if you haven't done Rust programming. It's just printing something on the screen. I think it's kind of obvious what goes on here. But now I would not like to compile that down to machine language, to Linux or, or Windows or whatever. We talked about that. But I would like to compile that to WebAssembly. How do I do that? Let's take a look at the, um, at the, at the just file. Here you see a rule wasn't time and it calls the build rule which is down here and you see this compiles this guy using cargo with the compilation target wasm32 wasi and this is the compilation target where rust is instructed to compile the code down to a webassembly module to a wasm file this wasm file can now not execute it can now be not executed directly, but we need a wasm runtime because this time we don't want to build the host ourselves. Doesn't 
doesn't make any sense. Why should we always build a host ourselves? If we simply want to run an app, we want to make a we want to have a ready-made host. So this time we're going to use wasmtime, the executable that wasmtime provides, and simply run it. And that is exactly what's going on here. So let's say just wasmtime. Let's run this guy and it says, see, hello world. And this hello world is not very, um, not very impressive, but if we know that this was now going through WebAssembly using wasmtime, it's getting kind of impressive. Because this demonstrates now that this WebAssembly module can run everywhere. Want to run it in the browser? Check. Works. Want to run it on Windows? Check. Wasn't time is available there. Want to run it on Linux? X64? Uh, X86? What, whatever you want, it's just WebAssembly. So portability without being tied to a language like with intermediate language from C-sharp. Okay? So this was the second demo that I wanted to show you. Let's create something more useful. Let's go quickly back to the slides. Mm. The, uh, try to follow along with the following train of thoughts. Why not building a web server that simply runs a separate process like you have seen it before whenever an HTTP request comes in? So we can build a web server in WebAssembly, of course, that takes an HTTP request, spins up wasmtime with an executable as you've seen it before, and we simply pass the the uh, the parameters, the query string, the headers, the body, and so on, through standard input, through command line arguments, through environment variables, and so on, and so on. Enter Waji, the WebAssembly gateway interface. It's an experiment. Probably you will not use Waji in the midterm to long-term future because it's a kind of intermediate step towards something larger, which you will see in five minutes or so. Um, and the concept is very similar to CGI to common gateway interface. Maybe you have heard that before. It's kind of old. I'm old enough. I know what that is. I worked with CGI. So when I saw Waji, it was kind of obvious to do that. So let me show you how Waji works. This is the most simple web API handler that you can think of. Get the idea? It's the same as the wasn't time example before. The only thing is we are returning the HTTP response using standard out. So the first line sets a, sets a header and the third line uh, is simply the body. That's it. Yeah, we can do that. So let's run this. Let's say just run level one, this one. It runs everything and I can go to my request here. And where is it here? Level one ping. And here you see Pong works exactly as expected. This is what I wanted to show you. So the idea here is pretty simple. We run fully on WebAssembly and we rely on the fact that we can, at least on Linux, very fastly create new processes and simply run our handlers in separate process. But again, on WebAssembly to not lose cross-platform capabilities. Okay, this was probably not very impressive, I know, but bear with me, I will show you more. The next demo is a little bit more exciting. So this demo um, takes a look at the various command line arguments that you see here. It prints the environment variables, as you can see here, and it prints the input from standard in. In this case, I'm really reading from standard in. Let's run level two. It's not very complicated, but it is a little bit more elaborate. So let's go here and let's call level two. You see, I'm passing in some query strings, who equals bar. I'm passing in some headers, application JSON for content type, and I'm passing in a JSON body. So let's run this guy. And you see that the, um, that the arguments here are essentially the query path, the query string and the path. The environment variables are, if we go down a little bit here, HTTP content type are essentially the headers. And down here, standard in becomes the body of the request. So this is the idea of Waji. Okay? Um, we, we simply run the app and we communicate using environment variables, arguments, standard in, standard out. Very simple. Not super efficient, granted, but it works. It works and it works 100% based on WebAssembly. I have not talked about isolation here, so let's go to level three. This level three thing, thing I will not walk you through the, the, the code exactly what this essentially does. I can go up and you can see it here. It uses a template language, handlebar, 
Uh, if you are a web developer, you probably know what handlebar is. There's a Rust implementation of handlebars, and this is exactly what I use here. And I would like to render the output uh, that you have seen before, but based on a handlebar template. But it happens that this render, that this handlebar template is in a separate file. You see here, we have it in a separate file. We want to keep it external. We want, we do not want to bake it into our Rust code. We want to keep the, the template file external. So it should be easy to read this template at runtime. Again, I will not go into the details of the code because this is not the point that I want to make. The point that I want to make can be found in this module toml. Because here, if I scroll down a little bit here to level three, you will see here the volumes. This is a volume mount. This is a volume mount very similar to a volume mount that you would do in Docker. So the WebAssembly module handling the incoming HTTP request is not allowed to access my entire file system. I can mount the folder where it finds the handlebar template into the volume slash templates and guess what if we take a look at the just file we are where is it where is it here the template path is directly uh, mounted to slash templates this is as exactly what i wanted to show you so we have isolation here let's try that let's run level three just run level three go into the requests and here we are, level three, file, foobar, and what we get is HTML, you see? This is the rendered and, uh, handlebar template, exactly like we want to have it. But what happens if we simply go here, take the modules file and hmm, comment out the volume section here, run it again, level three, go again into our requests file. Here is the request. Oops, sorry, I, I clicked wrong. Level three, run it, doesn't work. See, get an exception. Uh-uh, no access to the template file. Isolation, WebAssembly with isolation. So let's fix that again. So we see that this works properly. I showed you isolation from the file system, but what about networking? Does it work with networking too? Haha, uh -huh, yes, of course it did, um, or it does. Um, let me show you this example. Again, I will not walk you through the code in detail. Essentially, what I did is um, I created together with a young coder from the Coder Dojo, I uh, c created um, a Wordle solver. Do you know the Wordle puzzle? What we essentially want to do is we want to access the New York Times website from our WebAssembly component to get a list of possible words and calculate the correct solution for today. I hope it will work. If not, the point is only the web request, okay? So let me show you how this works. And that can be seen here again in the modules toml. I will zoom, zoom in a little bit, see? Here, in the modules toml file, I can limit through WASI, through the WebAssembly systems interface, I can limit the domains where our module is allowed to do HTTP requests to. So I can not only limit volumes, I can also limit um, network calls, for instance. And we can also limit CPU and memory. I showed you that in a C-sharp example. So isolation really works nicely. Let's try it, okay? So, okay, it runs. Let's go to requests. Let's go to level four. And today I think is the 11th of October. So let's just call this and see what's going to happen. What's going to happen? I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Does it work? It takes suspiciously long. It takes suspiciously long. <laughs> Did the New York Times block me? Uh, New York Times block me? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Let me try it again. <laughs> okay, try it again here and run it again socket hung up yeah this this is the thing with um with uh with, with preview software like that it doesn't seem to work I'm, I'm very sorry, but I think you got the idea, right? We will see another example uh, in, in two or three minutes because now we are leaving the world of Waji and we are, ex uh, we are, we are really um, entering the, the brand new and shiny world of the future, which is WebAssembly components. But I think you got the idea, right? Okay, so if we have Waji, why not going one step further? Why not going one step further and create a kind of WASM-based standard for running components? 
so that we do not need to spin up a process whenever we get an HTTP request. What we want to do is we would like to have a component model where we can run these components inside the same process, where we can do caching and things like that. So this is the next step, entering WASM components. And this standard is under heavy development. So don't expect that this standard is ready. You can experiment with it. It's under, you can influence it, but this is not done yet. First steps are done, but this is under, under heavy development now. But still, I can do a bunch of interesting demos. And uh, the, the, the demos that you are going to see, they use a cool framework that I really like and I want to give a big hand of applause for the uh, people at Fermion. Fermion is a company that invests a lot in the um, evolution of WebAssembly. They are, they are contributing a lot of code and they also built a web platform that is already using WebAssembly components. Their entire internal infrastructure runs on WebAssembly, has been running on WebAssembly for months, if not years now. So although you shouldn't use it in production, they already use it in production to just prove the point. And you see, um, there are language guides for various languages, so you can also try that in C-sharp, but I will show you spin with Rust, because Rust is very well supported. So here is hello spin. So again, I have created four levels. Let's take a look at the first level. It's kind of simple, but you immediately see the difference here. In this case, I no longer have um, a, an, a dependency-free Rust application that uses standard in and standard out. But here I'm using real um, higher level constructs like a request struct, like a response struct, like a builder pattern. So you see this code looks much nicer and at the end of the day it becomes a so-called HTTP component. This is what I mean, this is where we are heading towards. We do not want to spin up a separate process whenever we get a request. We would like to have a powerful framework in the middle and this is exactly what spin is all about. The configuration is done again in a TOML file and if you take a look here, this is the first configuration and it says level 1 and it, you have a router here, it routes all requests that come in and start with level 1 to this component here. And of course we can try it, we can say just run. It runs and if we go to the request file and start level 1, we are going to see exactly Pong. This is what I wanted to show you. So. The big difference is it's no longer a separate process, it's no longer standard in, standard out, but it has a beautiful API. The drawback is that you have dependencies. You have a dependency on the spin SDK, as you can see it here, because you are relying on this SDK and you want to rely on this SDK because it makes you more productive than just print line statements in, in Rust. It was kind of funny, right? It is, for some applications, maybe suitable, but in reality, you want something else. This doesn't, uh, this doesn't raise uh, developer productivity. So let it run down here. Let's take a look at levels two. Uh, it's essentially the same, but in this case, I am extracting the, um, the, different, the different elements here from this uh, API. So in, in, in spin, you have a nice API where you can get the URI, you can get the query string, you can access the headers, you can access the body. So it's really simple with a nice API that is self-describing um, to, to access the different components of the request. So I will not run that one because it's kind of of obvious. Level 3 is way more interesting because this time again we are using handlebar here. So this is the same example as you have seen with Waji but again with HTTP component as you can see it here. So for our talk the implementation is not that interesting but the interesting thing is again that you can do a volume mount here. See? By adding this files equals something, we can do a volume mount where the WebAssembly host mounts a certain directory, level 3 slash templates, to the WebAssembly component that can access these templates under slash templates. So this is what you see here in the, in the spin world. Uh, you want to see it? We can run it here, requests, and where is level 3? Here is level 3, let's run it. And if we see some HTML, see, this HTML was rendered with handlebars. So this was not created manually, it really comes from this template and believe me, just trust me, if I comment out the volume mapping, it would not find the templates. I showed you that in the Waji area. 
So, final demo, and I hope this will now work, because for Tacorama, what I did is I span up the, uh, the developer tools in my browser, and I took a look at the Tacorama website, what they do when you click on the session catalog, and it turns out that they have a kind of API where you have to send a little bit of payload using an HTTP POST request, and then you will get a nice little JSON formatted um, session catalog that you, they display on the screen using a single page app. And I simply wanted to make the point here at the end of this session by, by doing this HTTP request inside an HTTP component. And again, in the spin.toml file here, I can set the allowed HTTP hosts. So let's try this one, crossing fingers that it now works because this is the thing where we really want to go to. So see, level four, and if I run this, I get woohoo the session catalog. It's exactly the Tacorama session catalog. Doesn't be it, it, that that is not super impressive, but it is kind of impressive because we run our WebAssembly inside a sandbox, inside a component, inside a host, inside the spin host, and it can access the web, and we can limit it. We can limit it by going again to the spin dot commenting out this guy here, rerun the app go back to our request file, run it again, and it will not work. Isolation using WASM components. This is why I said, is this a container killer? And with this discussion, we are going to close. So what? Is it a container killer? Containers didn't kill hypervisors, right? We are still using hypervisors, cloud providers still using hypervisors. And exactly like that, WASM will not kill containers. Are you disappointed now? Did you expect me to say that WASM is going to kill containers? Obviously not. Of course not. But it is a very powerful extension. WASM is similar to containers, but on a higher abstraction level. You can put it, you can use it as an extensibility model of a custom host. We can use it to do um, micro-segmentation of, uh, for instance, web API handlers so that we can run semi-trusted code in a sandbox without having to go through containers, gRPC, and so on. We can simply make a WebAssembly web assembly function call. It is platform agnostic. It runs in a sandbox, and we can also make it pretty lightweight. There are so many application areas. Today you have seen primarily web servers, but think of cloud environments like serverless environments or edge cloud computing systems. Um, you, you can run semi-trusted code in sandboxes to, to protect against supply chain attacks. You can build an extensibility layer for business apps. So a lot of application um, areas. And this is exactly what I wanted to show you. We have five minutes or so left for discussion. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I hope you take away a little bit of, of a strategic view of an idea where this WebAssembly thing is going towards, where it's heading towards, and I hope it was an interesting experience. And with that, I would like to open it up for questions. Say again, thank you for having me. Have a great Techorama for those who have to leave immediately. Everybody else? If you have questions, ask them.